Quer desenvolver os talentos da sua equipe e potencializar os resultados da sua empresa? Conte com a expertise do atendimento corporativo do Senac São Paulo, que já capacitou mais de um milhão de pessoas e profissionais de instituições públicas, privadas e terceiro setor. Construa uma equipe altamente motivada e capacitada e destaque-se no mercado. Entre em contato, acesse sp.senac.br barra corporativo e saiba mais. Quer saber? Senac. Today on CityCast Denver. Mountains of trash. No hot water. Mice infestations. Renters across the metro area are facing these issues every day. But is there anything being done to protect them? We're on Landlord Watch, with two reporters digging into who exactly owns these problematic apartment complexes and how renters are fighting back. Today is Thursday, August 22nd. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Westward staff writer Katie Cheshire, welcome back. Hello. And Denver Post Neighborhoods reporter Megan Ululani Boynton, hello again. Hey, thank you all for having me. So we're on pace for record evictions, and we keep seeing these stories about renters pushing back on uninhabitable apartments. But like, we also, we're in dire need of housing. Uh, Before we dig into both of your stories, what do you think is going on? What's the bigger picture here in the metro area? I think in general, it's a difficult industry to regulate because in some ways it relies on people who really just want to make money deciding to do the right thing. And it seems like our city is grappling with what do we do if those people just don't decide to do the right thing? (laughs) That's That's an interesting way to put it. Megan, what do you think? I think in Denver in particular, too, our housing market is unique compared to the rest of the region. I think a stat that I like to pull out is that we have the most expensive housing market uh, that's not on a coast, uh, rental market. And so um, the city right now is kind of trying to get a handle on. I mean, I I think that the reason that they um, are doing the uh, they're having landlords apply for rental licenses is because they're trying to get a count of how many apartment units we have in Denver. So we don't even know the exact number yet. We have an estimate. But I, I just think this is a, an industry that's continuing to grow in a place like Denver. And so um, with that tremendous growth comes a need for more uh, oversight. Sure, sure. And we'll get into the rental licensing in a bit because, Katie, you did some real digging on that. But, um, Megan, I want to talk about this one apartment complex in particular, Fitzsimmons Place in Aurora, which has been in the news a lot in the last few weeks. Oh, yeah. Um Can you explain like really quickly what is happening with the tenants there or what has happened? Sure. Yeah. Well, the building is condemned, so nobody is living there now. But um, when I first started reporting this issue, a housing nonprofit had been alerted to the fact that this building was going to be condemned and told the residents. A lot of the residents here uh, at this building were um, Venezuelan migrants. So, you know, after making the journey to the U.S., they found a place to settle. And once they got to this building, a lot of them reported just untenable conditions, um, whether that was pest infestation or, you know, the actual uh, the actual infrastructure falling apart. Um, and on top of that, there were also uh, allegations of uh, gang violence. The residents have alluded to that. Uh, and that is really? kind of the, yes. And that is also the stance, though, that the property management company, CBZ Management, has taken to explain why all of these recent problems have occurred and said that's why they haven't had staff there for weeks. They actually, you know, stopped trash pickup. Uh, so when I went by, the uh, conditions were pretty, I mean, Pretty horrific. Well, if you think about, I saw, we, I think we saw some drone footage of of the building, and you could see the trash pile up, and it's like we don't think about what it's like if they just stopped picking up your trash one day, right? And compound that with you know twenty, thirty, forty units worth of trash. But the the gang part is really interesting. So that that rumor, or I don't know, I guess the like you said, the management company has said oh, there's this this gang infiltration and it's made it too dangerous for us to send staff there. But what did people in the building tell you about that component of the story? So we had heard from residents um, that there had been an incident where a manager had had a gun put in his mouth uh, and been robbed for or 
there was an attempt to rob him for, I think, a portion of rent or something. Um, and so even going to the news conference, the impromptu one that the residents held, some of the tenants had said, you know, we need gang violence to stop. Uh, but some of these problems that they have been dealing with as far as the conditions of the building go, they date back years. Right. I was going to say the city of Aurora knew about some of these major issues. Yes. Those have been reported for years. And so uh, they recently cracked down on it. Where the residents protested was the fact that they were given a six-day deadline to move out. Um, this is also coincided with the first day of school. Uh, when I went there, there were tons of little kids running around. These are a lot of families. And so uh, something else that the residents had mentioned was that they felt that they weren't given ample time to move out. Sure. Um, you know, they have to stay home from work to try and find other um, other housing options. Uh, they still had to, you know, take care of their kids. And Aurora does technically have a 15-day deadline that they can give as the maximum. Um, when I asked uh, the Aurora spokesperson uh, why they had chosen a six-day limit instead of pushing to a 15-day limit, they said that that was when they had scheduled the water to shut off. So Wow. So with the with Aurora's response to that, I just wonder like what then what kind of what happened? Because like you said, some of these these folks are um, newcomers to the city. They're in precarious situations. A lot of them probably are doing work, you know, day by day work. You can't just stop working. Kids can't just stop going to school. What happened to these families? Yeah. So they had to be out by last Tuesday morning. Um that day, I chatted with some of the um, housing advocates, uh, the nonprofits that were helping out, you know, these residents. Aurora agreed to paying for hotel stays for people who had not found alternative housing um, through the end of the month. Unfortunately, uh, early check-in had not been secured, and they had to be out of the building by that morning. And so by 2 p.m. that day, people were still standing around outside because they had nowhere else to go while they waited to be able to check into these hotels. Now, there is, uh, there's actually two separate legal actions that are happening. One is that the city of Aurora is suing uh, Zev Baumgarten, who is, I think, one of the, he represents CBZ management. And then a tenant is filing a class action lawsuit on behalf of him and other tenants. That was able to secure um, a temporary restraining order that allowed tenants to get housing upon their request from CBZ management. They either had to request a hotel stay or uh, for, I think, much longer for a couple of months uh, or a unit that was comparable to the one that they lived in from CBZ management. So that temporary restraining order only lasts two weeks. But uh, since then, uh, the judge passed it or a uh, the judge allowed it. And now they're trying to get residents to reach out to CBZ management and to uh, arrange that housing. Um, so I think we've been talking about this place in Aurora, but uh, Katie, you reported in Denver, we have a program that's supposed to sort of help avoid situations like exactly like this. Can you tell us about Denver's rental licensing program and how it's supposed to work? Yeah. So this program was passed by city council about three years ago now. The idea being we're going to, first of all, get a count of all the rental units that we have in Denver, because up to this point, we only had estimates. And second of all, and more importantly, we're going to make sure that all of our rental units have a base standard of health. So, you know, that's not ensuring that there's anything super fancy, but like your electrical cords won't electrocute you. And if there's a fire, you can get out of the house or you have a smoke detector that kind of thing. If there are cockroaches, your landlord helps you mitigate get rid that. of them. Yeah. So the really basic stuff, um, that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you reported recently on this um, building in particular down by the Cherry Creek Reservoir called the Felix, where it sounds like this isn't really working very well. What happened there? So these tenants uh, got together and they formed a union with the advocacy group, Denver Metro Tenants Union, which has unionized several buildings in the Denver metro area, as their name indicates. Um, and at the Felix, they went public, I want to say, in February, and they sort of said, hey, we haven't had hot water here consistently for, some people said, you know, six months, three months, three weeks. Like, And the problem according to the Denver Department of Health, is that the water goes in and out. So sometimes when they go there, there is hot water. And so it's hard for them to 
write up a violation for the landlord because if they're there and it happens to be a hot water time, then they can't say there's no hot water. So that's kind of what these tenants have been dealing with is this, that's sort of the big problem. Almost all of them also report mice and appliances that don't work, appliances that have led to flooding in their units. They have two pools that are advertised but have never worked. And I have to say, their um, their website <laughs> makes it look amazing. Yeah, They have exactly. like a dog washing facility. They have like pool tables. But you're describing a very different situation. Yeah, and I think that's somewhat what made the tenants want to get together. So they're like, we're supposed to have all of these things and we're paying for them and we have none of them. And we don't even have the basic things that we need. So in your story, you kind of dug into one of these inspectors who is, uh, I believe, employed by the city to uh, conduct these inspections that uh, renew the licensing programs that allow these places to be licensed. Can you tell us a little bit about this story about the city inspector? I think his name is Hasso Fleming Schutrumpf. Yes. And you did say that correctly. Thank you. <laughs> um, but he is not employed by the city. Oh, and, he's not. And okay. this is kind of what the tenants have a problem with is landlords to get their license have to hire a third party inspector to give their property the okay. They're supposed to randomly look at 10% of the units on site. So in the case of Hasso Fleming Shoe Trump, the tenants believed that the units he was shown by management were not random because a very high number of them were uninhabited at the time. And they believed that if it truly had been random, he would have run into the mice or the lack of hot water or some people have mold or the trash pickup is very inconsistent. Like when I walk around there, I almost always see a dumpster that's just full unexplainably. So their argument is because these people are not actually hired by the city, they're paid by the landlord. They have somewhat uh, of, of an a, incentive yeah. to maybe shuffle these along right and they're not necessarily even saying that this person lied they believe that he worked with management to get a positive outcome i have to say you link to a video i think in your story this uh interview with this gentleman this inspector it's like for a realtor's YouTube or something. And, and he says at the beginning, something uh, something along the lines of, well, I'm a landlord first and an inspector second. And it was just like very, I don't know, it felt very conflicting to this this issue that sounds like, is he being selective about the units that he, you know, like what's, what's really going on here? But I think first and foremost, I'm a landlord. And I really believe in being a landlord with heart. And I think I think that creates some of the challenges that I have with this program. I think the intentions are great. And I'm actually, as I do inspections, noticing things that, that um, all of us probably in our rentals could do better. And I feel like if we're going to legislate that everybody has a Mercedes grade rental property, it, it's going to create challenges where people who don't want to pay as much for a Mercedes can't really live in Denver anymore. The thing that I want to get to is, so Denver's Department of Excise and License, who's going to oversee this this program, um, their spokesperson, Chuck Hickey, says, we recognize that licensing landlords won't eliminate all irresponsible landlords, but accountability for landlords in Denver is higher than ever. In year one of the full licensing requirement, we've already seen a weeding out of landlords who care more about profit than people. Do you, I mean, other than the situation at the Felix, do you think that this program is working? I, I've find it hard to be too tough on the city just because I think that they were handed a very monumental task. Yeah. You know, we don't even know how many buildings that they are supposed to license. They're having to like comb through internet listings to identify where these buildings might be. So I think it's, it is really difficult and I don't think it's working right now, but I also have hope that maybe within like five years, they will have that full count and it will be that those who are really skirting the process can be charged or changed in some way. But right now it's just not really effective to help the people that need it the most.
Enquanto você curte um som, a ClearSale cuida da segurança antifraude de mais de 100 mil empresas em todo o mundo. Só falta a sua. Fale com os nossos especialistas e fique um passo à frente das fraudes e riscos de crédito. Encontre soluções flexíveis que se adaptam às necessidades da sua empresa e garanta múltiplas camadas de proteção em cada transação. Clear Sale. One step ahead. Você que está ouvindo o seu podcast, sabia que tudo que o Google faz tem a intenção de trazer impacto positivo? Como? O Jefferson da tribo Tail usou inteligência artificial para facilitar o dia a dia das empresas. Ele e milhares de empreendedores geraram mais de 188 bilhões com as plataformas do Google. E a Miriane? Se formou em UX com certificados profissionais do Google, criando o seu próprio negócio. Ela e 88% dos formados relataram avanços profissionais como promoção ou novo emprego. Tem que ser bom para todo mundo. Google. Megan, the the stories that you've been looking at around Fitzsimmons Place are in a different municipality, Aurora. How do you think Aurora's approach is is working or not working with this issue of tenants, you know, tenants versus landlords, essentially? I think that in this particular um, situation, I think the residents were happy to not be in a place with these conditions anymore. Um, But I think that they were not happy with the way that it was ultimately handled. I, I know that at a certain point, even residents had asked, um, had proposed an idea of, you know, can we just self-run this building so that way we don't have to uproot ourselves? Like, can we get some funding and can we take over this building? Because at a certain point, they were starting to organize their own trash pickup. Um, I, I think that both of these cities are kind of trying to... Um, try different approaches to handling this uh, this broader issue. And I haven't done as much reporting on Aurora and how they have handled, you know, these uh, tenant uh, landlord issues um, beyond CBZ management of this building. But it seems that, I mean, what I've heard from the lawyer, what I've read is that there are other properties that, you know, we need to be taking a look at that CBZ management runs um, to make sure that, you know, we don't have another Fitzsimons Place uh, situation happening. I also know that, I mean, even within my own inner circle uh, in Denver specifically, I mean, just housing condition issues like continue to be, I mean, just the the topic of conversation. I, I know that my my boyfriend lived at La Fonda Apartments in West Wash Park, and he had a landlord come in and, um, do some, I think, some impromptu work. They were trying to find, I think it was a leak, and so they broke open a wall in his unit and other units, uh, which led to a massive asbestos uh, <gasps> outbreak. They had to evacuate uh, the building. They were out for months. Um, it was just, you know, because the landlord hadn't taken the proper, um, hadn't done the proper procedures to make sure that there wasn't an asbestos outbreak in this building that's been around for, for decades uh, and was built, you know, when that was like a, a common uh, product to use. Um, I know that in my own uh, like experience, when I was living in Cap Hill, um, it was a first time landlord that I was working with. And it found, it just felt like she wasn't debriefed in kind of knowing that, Hey, we have a leak in the ceiling. You have to fix this or, Hey, our dryer is not fully working. Like, you know, and it's almost like you have to advocate for yourself, unfortunately, in some of these situations. Um, especially when it comes to people like first time landlords, um, who may not be aware of, you know, all of these policies that they have to follow. It almost feels like a part-time job sometimes to have to be advocate for yourself because the, on the other side of this, so many folks are paying a lot of money to rent. I mean, it's not cheap to live here. That's kind of what we talked about at the top of the show, but it's not cheap to live here, but you're also having to do this accountability piece for just being able to live in a, a place that's safe. Yeah. And I think to Megan's point, we do just let anyone be a landlord like it's not like there's a class you have to take and like my landlord is just a person and I like love her and I think she was sent from the heavens to me because <laughs> doing all this you, like, reporting, the landlord lottery <laughs> literally I'm like doing all this reporting I I am terrified of if I ever have to move honestly but I think that's a component that maybe Denver could look into is doing some more classes for landlords because right now is sort of the first time they've had to do this mass outreach and they're teaching them you have to get inspected and these are the inspection requirements but I don't know if that comes with teaching about like our state warranty of habitability that 
guides when repairs have to be well not have to because that has sort of failed at the legislature multiple times when they're supposed to be fixed and you know our city laws about health conditions and how you respond to them something like that I don't know if it would help because again it relies on people listening and you know going to the classes and taking them in but I think a registry for buildings is good but some sort of certification or class to own a building and rent it out is an idea that could help. I love that point too because I think we're talking about right now we're talking about big out of state management firms often that own a lot of properties, you know, in different parts of the country. They're not here versus like maybe your landlord Katie who's a person who maybe owns a couple of units and th- so maybe it's not just that there are bad landlords. There's just landlords that don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing or how to respond or how to do preventative work to make sure that their tenants aren't in this situation. And I really appreciate that. But um, the the interesting part with the Felix apartments and the tenants there is that uh, they've called on Attorney General Phil Weiser to look into this. And we know that the chair of the FTC, Lena Kahn, was recently in town to meet with local renter advocates. I wonder what you two are hearing about possible new programs or regulations to help manage these renter-landlord conflicts. Like, is there anything happening like what you're talking about? Megan and I both attended in January um, an event where Phil Weiser sort of did their first big crackdown fine action against a landlord in the state, and that was four-star apartment management. They had found that they were charging tenants to remodel units. So they were taking their security deposit, not for like, you left a hole in the wall or a stain in the carpet, but we need to update this unit. And even though it's <laughs> for fine, the next person, <laughs> right, literally. So they were taking people's security deposits and using them to enrich themselves, basically. And the attorney general cracked down on them, fined them. If people lived in their apartments at those times, they're able to reach out and get some monetary retribution. But that was the first time. And so I do think it's an emerging priority for the attorney general's office that there are these problems and we need to take a look at them. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Four Star Realty, they were operating um, predominantly in college towns, right? So like Fort Collins, Boulder. And this is, I think what sticks out to me is the fact that like for someone like me, like a journalist, it's pretty easy for me, you know, to like get on my, you know, former landlord and be like, hey, you know, I, I'm aware of these issues because I report on them. So, you know, you need to like step it up when it comes to, you know, like fixing my dryer. But there's a lot of people like college students, like recent immigrants, like non-English speakers, like people who are working two or three jobs to afford uh, Denver rent, um, who don't necessarily have the time to, you know, be on their laptop, look up the policies and see if like their landlord is, you know, uh, culpable for, you know, some of the living conditions that they're in. And so I, I think though, if there was something that I could tell listeners is that, I mean, you, something that we've put out on the the Denver post is like, Hey, here's a, an article that tells you, you know, the, some of the rules that your landlord has to follow and here's how you can report them if they're not doing that. Um, because unfortunately sometimes it takes elevating an issue to a higher authority, uh, for some of these things to be tackled. Yeah, that's a great point, too. And I think about that a lot as a reporter. Sometimes I'm like, other people don't have all day to be researching something for work that impacts their lives. And that's part of what our job is. But um, I guess maybe that's where I want to wrap up is like, I want to ask you both, what is working well for renters right now? Because we, I know we have a lot of renters who are listening and probably dealing with landlords this bad. But I wonder if there's if there's anything that you've heard that is empowering renters or 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 just going better than the other side of this. I think that I would definitely tell renters um, to do your research because I think that the the renters who have done enough uh, research ahead of time, and it's un- again, it's unfortunate that it has to fall to them, but people who are really kind of like looking at the Google reviews, looking at the apartments.com reviews of, you know, different uh, apartment buildings or even going as far as looking at, well, who owns this building and like, what is their mm, reputation? Yeah. Um, you know, nationally, are they having any issues? I think that by uh, getting ahead of it and, you know, really kind of like, taking the time to uh, to look into these places that you're going to be living for a year or more, um, it can hopefully help you set yourself up for success instead of maybe going with an option that, you know, you 
it looked nice on paper, uh, and then, you know, all of these kind of issues start to happen months into living there and you're, you're wrapped up in a lease. I like that thought. I think one of you reported that CBZ management, I believe, had an F rating by the Better Business Bureau. So it's something as simple as Googling who owns this building, what is their track record? Totally. And I think the other thing that is encouraging to me is sort of there are more tenant unions cropping up. Um, there's multiple organizations doing it. And I don't think you even have to unionize as a renter if you don't want to go that path. But just talking to your neighbors is another thing I would recommend. Like mm. me recently in my apartments, we had our hot water that was broken for a day longer than they're technically allowed to be broken for. And I was like, should I put up a letter just to say, hey, everyone, just so you know, <laughs> this is a problem because I honestly don't know if my neighbors know that. And I didn't do it because um, it, they did fix it and it was Or fine, maybe but... your, your neighbor has a tip like, oh, you know what? I, I text them and that usually is an easier response or I've noticed that our landlord is available more at this time. This is what I would do. Just like, yeah, just like sort of crowdsourcing information and not necessarily having to go to the unionization route, although we've seen that be very effective. But like there's I think there's also the people that are struggling with some minor issues, but it's not life or death like this situation of an uninhabitable building. So I love the idea of just talking to other people. Yeah. And if you're scared to you know, ask your landlord yeah. for something and you've talked to your neighbor and they have the same problem is less scary if you're like, you're not hey, alone. Both of us are having this issue. And then it's just easier, I think. A to united deal front. With. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, our newsletter editor, uh, Peyton Garcia, wrote in the Hey Denver newsletter recently about um, some tips that actually we got from a reader about how to get your safety deposit back if you don't get it back right away. Um, so we'll have some more information in the show notes. But we'll also link to both of your stories. Thank you, both so much. This has been a really enlightening conversation. Thank y'all so much. Yeah, thanks. We want to hear from you too. Do you have a great landlord you want to shout out or a terrible landlord you want to warn people about? It's time to share the knowledge. Text or leave us a voicemail with your name and neighborhood on the Landlord Watch hotline at 720-500-5418. Again, the Landlord Watch hotline is open at 720-500-5418. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed this show, why not take a minute to tell CBC management about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye-bye. Uh, cup of coffee. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. Uh, banana. Oh, I'm also a cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm not ready to eat yet. I knew that you guys would ask me. So you so had to. I <laughs> ate a banana. <laughs>